everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm here with the rather wonderful Mr. Peter Thorne. How are you, Pete? Good, man. It's good to be here. I called you by your phone. Peter Thorne. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Thorne. <laughs> um, we got a lot to talk about. We do. First of all, we're good friends. Yeah. Um, you came to my birthday party at Sunset Sound. That yeah, was which was great. The legendary Sunset Sound. What so an just, amazing place. Yeah, and you had a great party. That was really cool. Thanks for having me. Well, you, you know, it's only great because basically everybody that we know came. So we just have a great bunch of musicians, engineers. And we just talk about that. The LA scene is actually quite healthy. Yeah, it is quite healthy. It's, a, it's a, well, we were just talking about it before. It's like if you stick around long enough, the community seems to, it's a tight community and it gets smaller and smaller. And you know people, you know. And if you stay in the game and you're a yeah. nice person and you work hard. People, yeah, people it, look after you. There's a gig coming up. They're like, I like that. That Pete guy, I'll call him up and he'll get that gig. Yeah. It's all about building relationships. So I suppose it's, we've got a lot to talk about. I want to talk about, uh, because obviously, probably a lot of people will know you because of your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. But like myself, you actually have a profession that you do YouTube alongside. You know, right. you right. are a professional session guitar player, whether it be uh, playing and recordings or touring a lot. Um, so I'd love to know a little bit about your journey. And then of course you have this beautiful guitar, which I'm sure a lot of our viewers and of course all of your viewers will know about. But most importantly, I suppose, is you've got a new amp that we want to mention as well. The new amp, the uh, PT15IR, which we're really excited about. So we have a lot to cover. Yeah. So first of all, you're Canadian. Yeah, I grew up in Canada. Uh, I lived there until I was about 19, and then I jetted off for GIT. And uh, Oh, in LA? Yeah, I went to, went to GIT at that point, uh, and then I was, I was hooked. And, and then I was kind of back and forth between Canada and the States for a long time, and then ended up kind of there for, I, I got in a band, actually. I got a record deal over in Japan, but it was a U.S.-based band. Yeah, and we got signed in for Japan and Southeast Asia market, right. and that took me permanently kind of to the States ever since. So. Yeah, that was 95, 95. So you haven't been back? To live I'm, since to live. then, not since then, no. Oh, yeah, wow, that's, that's, that's... Yeah, I pretty much got a, you know, got my work visa and relocated, and then I was in L.A. after that, and it's just been a procession of, you know, gigs and stuff since then. So for guys that probably, guys and girls that want to know, how, what, what happened? You graduated from GIT. Yeah. Um, so did you get a gig, and that enabled you to get a work visa? Yeah, essentially. Gig. Well, it was actually a band that I ended up working with that was based in LA, but I was back and forth from Canada to LA. We wrote, we wrote and demoed like fifty tunes. Oh, and I see. Uh, a guy named Frank Symes, who's a great guitar player and player, you might know him. I'm not sure, but he played with uh, uh, Don Hanley, Mick Jagger, Warren Zevon, all kinds wow. of great gigs. So when I met him, he was touring and uh, playing with Don Hanley and Mick at the same time. He just got in the Mick Jagger gig, which I was like, wow, this guy's obviously a good guy to hang out with. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he's a terrific musician, so I learned a lot from him. But anyway, I got in that band, and uh, the great crew to fall in with, really, uh, those, those folks, because they just right away kind of taught me a lot about being a professional musician. Not just being like in a band. Like I didn't get in a band in Hollywood. I got in a band in North Hollywood. <laughs> you know, those sure. this, everybody that was living in the Valley that kind of yeah. played a lot on sessions and records and things. Yeah. Those were the people that I was sort of real lucky to fall in with, I feel right. like. Um, so anyway, we wrote and demoed about 50 tunes and eventually that band got this, this Japanese record deal because Frank, interestingly enough, is half Japanese, could sing fluently in Japanese. Oh. And when we weren't getting, we were real close a couple times, like RCA, nice. getting nice. signed and stuff in LA, it just didn't happen. The Japanese thing happened, we signed that deal, made a record for Japan and Southeast Asia, and that was the beginning of me being a pro musician. Great, so you, <laughs> you had a record deal, so you got sponsored by the label. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly how it happened with me. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. From, from I, the UK. From the UK. I came over. We recorded an album here on, on a like a short work visa. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the band got a record deal with an American record company. And I got a yeah. work visa through that. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I think just a, an, a quick fun topic because I get approached by a lot of people that are in L.A., have been to school or come over, fall in love with it, want to work more. And like, how do you stay in the country when you're from another country? It's a real struggle. And it's not something that a lot of American musicians maybe even realize, but it's yeah. something we had to deal with both of us, I yeah. guess. And I, actually just next week, I'm finally taking uh, my oath and becoming a, a US citizen. So I'll be a dual, dual national, but a uh, man, what a long road. So you're in that band, presume you start touring a lot. Um, where did it sort of become? Because band guy is one kind of person. We know yeah. we know band guy. Band guy is all about the band. We're all into like our parts for that songs, yeah. and, and you know you get to hone them on the road. You get to go into rehearsal rooms and hash them out. Now, yeah. being a session guitar player, as you know, 
is completely different. You'll turn up cold into a room. Yeah, maybe it's friends of yours that are in the in the band, but you usually played back a track. Yeah. You know, maybe it's a vocal acoustic demo. Sometimes it's a re- song that you're reproducing. But whichever way it is, you've got minutes to chart it and yeah. minutes to get it right because you don't want to be the guy that's still trying to figure out the chord sequence yeah. while the drummer's like put down five takes and bored. Sure, sure. What was that transition? Because that's quite a different guy, band guy to session guy. Yeah. Well, w- once again, it was those folks that I fell in with, like Frank, and, you know, they, they were in that world. And I learned a lot. Mark Goldenberg, uh, some of these people that were really, uh, you know, just exceptional musicians. And I learned a lot from watching them and just right. observing and how they, how they did things. And, uh, and they, in turn, sort of trusted me and helped sort of mentor me a little bit. And so right. it was really, really helpful. Now, having said that, the, actually, the majority, because I have had stints of sessions, uh, that, that, but the majority of the stuff that I've done for my professional career, I have to say, is live playing. Getting gigs as a touring guitar player, which is sort of a different skill set, I guess. But um, so that's been... Uh, been a basically after I got out of that band, which didn't really the record didn't do anything, and sure. you know, so a year year and a half went by, and then I was out looking for a gig again. Uh, I sort that's when I, I started doing auditions in L.A. and looking for tours and things like that, and also trying to get sessions. And, and this. But the funny thing about doing sessions is this is an important thing to note if you're going to go to Nashville, or if you're going to go to L.A. or a music town, you kind of almost I feel like have to make the choice: do I want to be a session musician and play on records, or do I want to? tour and go out of town. This is something like Tim Pierce, our good friend, yep. made the active, you know, yep. conscious decision that if if he, he thought, if I go away on tour a, a lot, uh, people aren't going to know I'm in town. They're going to think I'm away all the time. They're not going to call me for sessions. So I better stay in town because I want to play on records. Which yeah, is something for, he did. Well, he um, did. And uh, it's yeah. interesting because you, you, we think about it for people that don't know, and I know you know this, Tim's a guitar player on the very first Bon Jovi song, Run Away. Run Away, yeah. The first hit. That's him. Yeah, that amazing guitar solo. Pre Richie parts. Sambora. Yeah, pre Richie Sambora. Yeah. So, and I mean, his resume with Meatloaf, Roger Waters, you name it. I mean, yes, he could take any touring gig that he wants. Yeah. But you're right. It's, but you've, you, you've navigated that really well. You really have. I mean, I've, yeah. I've, I've been in LA almost this, pretty much the same time as you. Mm. And I've, be, I've seen you be around while I'm developing and I was learning this and, and our yeah. paths have crossed. And, you know, I used to sure. be a co owner, as you know, of, of swing house back in the day. So yep. you'd be in, a, I'd be in the tra- back tracking an album and you'd be in the front room with Chris Cornell rehearsing and many, many other artists. Yep. So yep. that's right. When yeah. you used to have long hair. Yeah. 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 Oh man, <laughs> you're going, you're going back a ways, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh it's, it's a funny thing. It's um, you, you work hard and you learn how to make your way and you learn how to navigate that town and you just stay in the game and be a good person. And, uh, and you have to, I, I've said this recently, but you have to be able to play. That's a prerequisite. Like you got to know yeah. your instrument and you've got to be able to think on your feet. And, uh, you know, like you said, like special sessions and things, you got to come up, you got a few minutes to come up with a cool part. And if you can't, then, then you know, they're going to go, they're going to move on to somebody else next time. You're not going to get that Absolutely. Call. So it's really, it's really important. But beyond all that, I think, we can probably agree it's about being a good hang, being a good person, you know, being being friendly and being on time and uh, and, and somebody that, uh, and these are things that maybe the bands that you've worked with, you know, I know you've worked with a lot of big rock bands and stuff and it's like, you get a lot more leeway in those situations, mm-hmm. I think. If you're in a big famous band, uh, you, you get this leeway to kind of, you know, screw up every now and then or you're late or, and it's just like, oh, that's rock and roll, you know. Um, when you're a side s- man, not quite so much. Yeah. Yep. I call it the Superman Clark Kent because it's like you got to be Clark Kent most of the time when you're a side musician or a session musician. And, uh, you know, imagine that you're, you know, you, you just got to be cool when you're off stage. You got to be like not too full of yourself. You got to be confident, but you got to be, you, 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 you're working a job, you know, you're there to get a job done and the star is the star. You work for that person. But when you get on stage... And then it's time to take that guitar solo and there's a big ego ramp and they want you to go out there and get beside him and go back to back. All of a sudden you're Superman and they, and you got to go into that persona and, and they got to know that you can handle that and be confident, you know, and then as soon as you get off stage and it's after the gig, it's time to chill out again, but they still get to be the rock star. (laughs) That's part of the job. And you have to have, you you have to read those cues. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of uh, psychology. Yeah. You have to read it. I I know a very famous story and we can, I'll tell you who is off camera. If you don't already know of a guitar player in town Mm. that during a gig went to take the solo, walked in front of the singer like leaned back, 
and just started shredding. Yeah. And you could just see the singer, who oh, I'll give you a clue who it is, who also happened to be a bass player, just oh. looking down like, yeah, really? Really? Really, kid? <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know that story, but that's amazing. I'll tell you later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want it to be good. all over the interwebs, all over the internet, but yeah. 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 yeah, it's these fine line things where, because sometimes, you know, and I, I I'll, these days I'll just ask the artist sometimes. Yeah. Like when I get a gig, I'll be like, look, I want to make sure I don't step outside of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. step over any boundaries here. So, and I'll try and say, you know, how, like, what, do you want me to go, you know, out to the edges of the stage? Do you want, or do you kind of like it, you know, and, you know, I want to do what you want. I want to do a good job. And, and it's great. Many times I've been fortunate enough these days to work for people that are like, you can go anywhere you want. Just have a good time. And I'm like, that's awesome. But, but by the same token, Melissa Etheridge, when I played with her, she paid me a nice compliment saying he always knows when to step up and play and go for it. And then he always knows when to step back. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was it because sometimes I'm, it's like, oh, am I, is it too much? Is it too, you know, you're playing these and you don't want to get in that mode too much because then you, it could affect your playing. I, I, I want to move. I definitely want to move on to the guitar and the amp. But I must yeah. say one last thing as a compliment to you. I made an assessment that you had done probably more recording sessions and live work, and now I realise because I'm put, putting together in my head all the live gigs I know you've done. And I've realised that there are tons and tons of them because. It's usually studio guys that play like you. What I mean by that is like the studio guys usually play the minimalistic right thing straight away oh. because they've been beaten up by every single producer ever. Like you know how <laughs> Tim is. Tim comes in and he's like block chords and then somebody says to him, play a solo, and then it's the best, most melodic guitar solo you've ever heard. But he yeah. doesn't, he's not looking to play the guitar solo until he's been told. He's had Matt Soletic, you know, me mildly, but like Rob Cavallo, all the, right. the biggest producers in the world have told him and taught him what to do. Yeah. I noticed even when you were setting up the amp off camera, you played like specifically to get the tone. Mm. You weren't like, hey, there's people in the room, there's a couple of cute chicks over there. <laughs> you know, it, right, you know right. what I mean? Yeah, sure, yeah. We had chords. Chance. Chords yeah. is a good thing, simple. Yeah, yeah. but that's, that's uh, <laughs> it's, it, it, actually not as strange as you might think. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, I, well, and I just love songs. So at the end of the day, I want the tone and the part and everything to serve the song. Because yeah. actually guitar histrionics are sort of, um, I'm impressed for, you know, like probably most people like 45 seconds or something and yeah. I tune out. I'm just not really that interested yeah. in it. I want to be moved by a song or music. Sure. And that's why, you know, my favorite guitar player is always, you know, it's David Gilmour or, you know, folks like that that just really are. The Jeff Becks. The, Jeff Beck, you know. The uh, guy that kind of that plays a note, you're like, I would never have thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, and then it, on a like a high, you know, octane rock and roll thing, it's Eddie Van Halen for sure. me, who is so damn musical in his well, rhythm he, playing, you know. Uh, well, I heard about Van Halen. I'd I, you, I've, I've heard you play in, in rehearsal. I heard you play some Van Halen stuff. Yeah. What I like about uh, Van Halen is he knows how to make things like pyrotechnically, you know, exciting, yeah. but keep the blues in them. Yep. He just and seems to, yeah. And the phrasing and the and, and and it always comes back to a killer rhythm part because he's an exceptional rhythm guitar player, yeah. you know. So it was like it was all, the, but that's about as technical as I actually really ever need to hear as Eddie Van Halen. I know? agree. That's he's just a, to me the pinnacle. Of, of all that. right, let's. Uh, yeah. um, by the way, we're at Toman. Toman's University. Gearhead University. I, want, I forgot to mention that right at the beginning, but it's phenomenal. We're in beautiful Trippendorf. Um, it's in Bavaria. It's absolutely gorgeous. They it treat really us is. like kings and queens. Kasha was over there. Yeah. They treat us so well. It's ridiculous. Yeah. We have this beautiful hotel we're staying at. They're feeding us. Yeah. It's I bought some ice event. cream last night because I left the campus, but that's the only money I've spent since I've been there. I, I know, right? Yeah, Isn't we really haven't. Yeah. yeah, you're right. In the last three days, I didn't even really think about that, but that's bonkers. Yeah, they really are doing yeah. uh, a nice event, and it's a lot of fun. I compare it to, I don't know if you feel this, but to me, uh, it's like sort of like being in a band, but we're making videos. So you're collaborating mm -hmm. with creative people, like like you would get a drummer and a bass player yeah. and a guitar player together in a room. But instead, we're like, what if we did this, and what if we did that? And we're thinking about how to make videos about music. And about uh, and it's a similar collaboration, so it's yeah, just really a fantastic. fun, creative thing. Yeah. So tell us about the guitar. I did get yeah. to play it a little bit off camera, so um, I just want to let you know it plays like a dream. But um, I'd yeah. like you to strum through it because it'll be easier for you to demonstrate. Now, yeah, it's a five position switch, but it is a humbuck, two humbuckers. So what does everything yeah. do? Yeah. So the bridge, the bridge uh, humbucker right now, and these are like fairly low output pickups, very PAF in strength. So. Now, 
if I pull the uh, yeah, it's just got a great even the you know the the clean tone on the on the uh, and I I usually if I'm playing clean I'll go to the neck or the middle position, but um, by itself it just sounds really great you know for so that's the series clean tone basically the full humbucking series. Do that I got parallel now on the bridge pickup. So you got a couple options for the for that that pickup just right there. Now if I go here to the next position on the switch, sort of you know uh, this it's basically what's going on is this pickup, this pickup, just these coils, so single coil. So you get a nice. That kind of thing. It's great. And then, yeah, it's nice, you know, great. It, it does really credible single coil sounds, you know, I think, this guitar. So now middle position is these pickups, full humbucking. This was a series. personal favorite of mine. Okay. This position, yeah. Tough. And it's great for, you know, when we go to the overdrive, I could, you know, and it would do that thing yeah. incredibly well. Yeah. Um, then going to this position, it's now the neck humbucker, which is... Um, it's really a low out, low wind Elnico Five pickup. This one, and so it's got a nice clarity. Even who for, makes the uh, pickups? Uh, it's Sir. Yeah. Oh, so they wind them themselves. And Beautiful thorn buggers. I suppose it, it's got a kind of a, um, if you don't mind me comparing, like a, a, a Seymour Duncan jazz kind of feel. Is that, yeah, yeah. Is that sort would, of what you were going for? It would be really close to a jazz, actually. Yeah, like in the, it may be a little bit more of an offset wind because I think the jazz has a, uh, probably match coils, but oh, okay. uh, but it'd be close in, in output and same magnet and alcohol. Yeah. Classic pickups, yeah. Great. Exactly. That's now the single coil. It'll do pretty credible. You know that thing. You yeah, know? yeah, and absolutely. The, it's good. You know, so so it's. I was trying to build a guitar that I could take on stage and get a whole ton of sounds. If I got to get a Stratty thing, if I got to get a Telly thing, if I got to get a Les Paul thing, I could do it with this one instrument and get really close and really credible tones. A bit of a jack of all trades, but it's a. You know, I, I I thought a lot recently about people that have signature gear, mm -hmm. and when you think about a you know a John Petrucci from Dream Theater or a Steve Vai, they've got these guitars that are very kind of unique to them, like mm -hmm. in the look and the you know and they're and they're they're not a Strat, you know, and they're not a you know, and th they can be because it's John Petrucci and he's a, he's a, like a rock star guitar player in, in his own right, you know. So sure. he, it's Absolutely. it's a guitar that's built very much, mm -hmm. you know, to to play uh, his music, you know, and exactly the way he wants it. With my job, I have to cover a lot of ground, and I'm always switching up tones and being a bit of a jack. I think utilitarian is always the way so, to go. Yeah, I mean, it can't. You know, I love yeah. like the, the the dedicated thing too, mm -hmm. and that's a, a bit, certainly no. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that uh, that it's a. I love those guys and their gear. They get to be because they're rock stars, and they get yeah. to be. I've got to be one day. Uh, uh, you know, I could be playing a, playing a clean, funky thing, and the next day I'm doing shred solo or something. It depends on what the gig is. So this guitar reflects that. That's all I'm saying is that it's a That's it's amazing. a bit of a jack of all trades, and I want to I want it to be a guitar that I can take to a gig or a session, get a ton of sounds out of. So it's um mahogany body, mahogany neck, maple top, and rosewood board. So like our favorite guitars from Kalamazoo, that kind of thing. But it's mm -hmm. a 25 and a half scale. So um you know it's kind of a Bit of a hybrid. So. Well, which, just just because I'm intrigued, what, what gauge of strings do you like? I like 9.5s actually now, so 9.5 mm. to 44, which is something that I kind of learned from uh, Brian Ray. Um, he oh. he's, he was using 9.5s, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'd heard of them, but I'd never. Well, because I played it, and I couldn't figure out what they were. <laughs> that's probably yeah, explains why. Because they're right in the middle. Of, yeah. You know, and that's just uh, me getting a little bit older and and being like, I don't want to. I just, I, you know, what it was? It was real hot in Japan last year on tour, mm -hmm. and and I've recently found out that this is n something that other guitar players find as well sometimes. But the heat and the humidity, mm -hmm. strings can feel heavier. And on stage, mm -hmm. you start sweating and stuff, and it's just like bending becomes like a slog. And it's a weird thing. And I'd heard that, like, uh, Paul Gilbert, for instance, when he goes from climate to climate, he'll sometimes switch a string gauge down if it's, you know, that mm -hmm. hot, kind of humid thing. So that was happening to me in, in Japan. And uh, I just thought, I just want to try something. I don't want to go to nines, but I'm going to try these 9.5s. I tried them. I dig it. So. I actually, please don't laugh at me, population of the world. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Yeah, well, it's, not a lot of people do, but you can get those half gauges now. And who, which manufacturer? 
So this was a funny question because it might get me in trouble, but it's uh, so I'm an Ernie Ball guy. Yeah. And I've always been an Ernie Ball guy, and I don't think they have a 9.5 on the market right now. Okay. But I, I play Ernie Ball strings, and they're 9.5. <laughs> I'm going to get a bit in trouble. <laughs> I th it might be like a prototype thing or something. But, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But well, anyways, well, yeah. Uh, Commercially, I like Diodario makes them. They, they have a brand. They have a line of 9.5s. So but you have, you have the but. the only person to have Ernie Ball 9.5s. Maybe. <laughs> they're going to be so pissed. <laughs> but anyways. I think they're going to be yeah. happy because you just gave them a shout out. I, I hope so. Yeah. No, I love Ernie Ball strings, man. I've used them for, for uh, well over 10 years now. Well, I'm going to steal the guitar from you because you're going to talk us through the amp. Yeah. So this is where I get to have some fun. Let's do that. And I and I already already played this, as we said, the guitar off camera, so I know have, it's phenomenal. I'll mention one more thing. Yes, have fun please. with the trim, because this this is a running change we've made. This is a new Wilkinson bridge, and if you look at the little Allen screws, the mm -hmm. strings are locking underneath them. So this is oh, like got the stability of a bridge like a Floyd Rose, tuning-wise, but it, it will not go to tune, but it sounds like a strap bridge, and it strings like a strap bridge. Oh, wow. I'm really useless range. with these things, so don't laugh at me if I just okay. go. It's about what you're going to get from me. It'll stay in tune, even doing flight. Yeah. That was very smooth. I mean, yeah, for me, it'd be like... Yeah, my, probably like Johnny Marr is all I know how to do. I've never, never knew I how to do it. I love Johnny Marr. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. So tell okay. us about the amp. Most important thing, three channels, all tube. Uh, you know, that's that's the thing. But we wanted to give people an extra special kind of experience with this amp, which was, you know, I was just thinking about all the quiet stages that are happening now. You know, there's folks playing in church and in casinos and in places like they won't even let you have an amp or a cab on stage these days. So, that, true. you know, there's been this, re and even on tour, I mean, I've done a, a pop tour where we weren't allowed to have cabs. So, you know, it was cabs isolated under the stage in boxes with mics where we could use load boxes and speaker simulation and that kind of thing. And it's it's these sorts of situations that we wanted to help people out with that have the, 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 the thinking, maybe they should go to a modeler, maybe they should be using the Kemper or something like that, uh, because it's going to be easier, you know, they can just plug in, go direct, in-ears, that kind of thing. But maybe you're a diehard like two band person and just like simplicity and like to turn out, you know, reach out and turn a mm -hmm. gain knob if they want you want more gain or, or a treble knob without having to like page through a menu or something like that. That yep. so you know two bands and they just besides that they you turn them on they smell good they're sexy they look cool <laughs> <laughs> so there's all those aspects. Yeah. So for for the two band person, I think the tactile thing is really important to me. I think it's the one thing yeah. that people keep still are still use some kind of hardware. I think we. So even from a recording engineer perspective, like we st we still want that idea that oh yeah, that's, oh no, you know, and it yep. just doesn't feel the same with the mouse. It just doesn't. Totally, that's it, and that's a great actually, you know, pers uh, sort of analogy perspective that I, c I can riff on in a second here, and I'll show you because it yep. really is reaching out, turning that knob, and finding the sweet spot, just yep. like you do on a recording console or anything. So. So right now we're, we're plugged in, by the way, through a, a cabinet here that I think is a 212 with a V30 in it. So it's down there. So we're, we can listen to the amp initially here just as a three channel tube amp plugged into this cabinet and kind of judge it on those merits. Sounds great. It's very inspiring. Yeah, it's it's basically what you've got is the you know our favorite yeah. amps from uh, Southern California on the yeah. Clean Channel, that yeah. kind of thing. Trying to optimize that really, um, and and it, you know it'll get dirty as well. You can crunch it up and get into Tweety territory. Got yeah. that, and then you can back it down and get real sparkly and clean and blow. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. 
and then on the dirty side, it's full on Brit. You know, the, to, oh, yeah. trying to do the 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 martial thing to the T. You know, like as good as we can be. You know, kind of optimize that. So that's the amp in a nutshell. And I mean, it's pretty it's pretty healthy. Look for 15 watts. It's got headroom. And you know, I wasn't. I had the master no higher than three and a half or four right now. I was so loud. It's pretty. That's pretty, a show. Yeah. Could so do a show. Yeah. Small I, clubs, no problem. I think so. You With know? no mic on it. But now yeah. the real crazy thing is. The, I can simply go behind the amp right now and yank the speaker cable. Now, what would happen on a regular tube amp when you did that and played? You'd probably blow a fuse if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> With a transformer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right now what you're hearing is this stuff over here. It has a built-in server reactive mm -hmm. load and, uh, and built-in impulse response nice. speaker simulation. So super high-quality digital speaker simulation, essentially. What, what we've got is I call it modeling the back end. You're modeling the speaker in the cab and the microphones. You know, it's not a modeler, it's modeling the back end, you know, and, you, and it's a full on tube amp. So now what we can do, because it's now we got the sound coming through some, some monitors here in front of us. Grind up, this is channel one now running through. What, uh, let me think about this cabinet. It's a 112 open back cabinet with a few microphones on it, an IR of a, I think it's a 57 and a 121 on the front, and then a 57 on the back blended in. Great combo. doing right now is I'm actually bringing up and down the master so if I go like this and it's kind of clean if I start pushing it and it gets dirty that's the power tubes pushing so right. so now we're getting we're getting a power tube breakup which now as it, it's not loud right now I mean this is like home TV volume what we got going yeah absolutely so with an amp like this you can now experiment with all these shades of drive you know and even in a home studio it's like right. a baby sleeping in the next room or something you know? that sound like that's cool but maybe I want it a little bit warmer a little less edge on top different IR now so different impulse response That's channel two, and that's a greenback impulse response. Greenback in a 412. I can go to channel three, do this. Same speaker, same, same impulse, but say I want something different. Maybe I want to try V30. So this is V30 now. It's like, oh, that's cool. I like that. Now check this out. I can actually just store it in there. And what happens now is I've got a different IR on each channel. So it'd be like having three cabs live nice or in the studio you know all mic'd up ready to go so now i can switch channel one i got an open back channel two is a green back channel three is a v30 That. <laughs> so it's just we're trying to make, make the tube amp that yeah, is usable yeah. in every. I mean, it's even got a headphone jack on it. So this is an amp you can take backstage. How long, you take, how long are you working on this for? You know, yeah, I got to give the credit to Kevin Sir. Really, like we've been batting the idea around for uh, a, a number of years now. But Kevin, in the last year, mm -hmm. he really just this was his project, and right. he's John Sir's son, and he's an EE. He's a he's a you know electrical engineer. The like, real genius, young guy. You know, I don't know, he's twenty five, something like that. Perfect. And we, John said. You take this and make it your baby. Here's the basic thing, the topology, there's the basic circuit layout that I want. Yeah. But all this stuff, he figured out how to do. So the headphone amp was actually his idea. He said, do you, th you think it makes it like too kind of like practice amp consumer sort of thing? And I'm like, you know what? It's cool, man, because literally this amp you could take backstage, 
with headphones on, it's got an aux in, so you could take, you know, like an input from your phone or something, play along to some tracks, practice. Nice. You know, no, and it's loaded down, you don't need a cabinet, so you can oh, just yeah. sit there with just headphones and play silently, or you can plug it into a little power speaker, like a Bose or something, yeah. practice like that, walk out on stage, put it on the cabinet, plug into a cab if you want, or not, you know, you don't need to, send a line to front of house and monitors, and what you got in your in-ears or in the wedges is this stuff, perfectly mic'd, you know, ready to go speaker simulation that's the mic's not gonna fall off the cabinet and you're not in the PA mm -hmm. that night or all any of that stuff. Well I What's, think plus and 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 you, and you got a traditional speaker too if you want, you know, yeah. and you can get feedback and all that. So but it's, plus it's everything. when you're learning a set, you know this is a live guy. Yeah. So if you're learning somebody's set, you can dial in the sounds that you're gonna use. Exactly. That's yeah. the thing that you can get that exact thing. Do it all at once. You know, you could have your pedal board backstage, you know, before a gig, and if you were trying to dial in your delay levels mm -hmm. just to make sure that they sound good in the loop, or you know, to make sure the mix is. You can have the track that you're learning playing yeah. back, and you can be dialing in your sound, and it's set. Yeah. I also think another right. thing that I, this happens in pro audio a lot, um, you know, in the recording side, and I'm sure is just as relevant when it comes to guitars and amps and pedals. Mm is that one of the things is sometimes people do too much. Like you've got three different sounds here. That's probably more than enough. I think so. Because you can pedal on your clean, you can pedal on your crunch, yep. and your lead, your lead. And if you want to put a compressor pedal in, great. Yep. You've already added on off maybe three different versions of every sound again. Yep. I remember when the first like Boss and Roland ones, I mean, they, they were fantastic. When they came out, you could program 120 sounds. I remember getting lost and frustrated. Right. Yeah. And Option thinking anxiety. that I liked 117, but was it really 113? <laughs> right, 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 right. And I did the, the delay. Yeah. I, I just don't think the human brain is like that, especially yeah. when you're working. When you're playing, you want to go, yeah, I want to go to the lead tone. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Rather than the lead tone with the touch of the chorus, but the flanger has yeah. to be slowed down. The solo's right over by that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. totally agree with you. Yeah. That's the thing, it's simplicity. Like, I want more trouble. There's more trouble. Yeah. We're done. <laughs> yeah. I think that's something that gets lost a lot. I think it's yeah. it's it's the beauty of, of of you designing it because you actually use the gear. A lot of the time it's you know, it's it don't undersell yourself when you're saying that, you know, a lot of the the, the was the, the father and son, which is amazing that you give a shout, but the, you've got to guide people. When you're an end yeah. oh, user, definitely. you've got to guide them because I've seen a lot of near pretty bad misses. You know, oh like, yeah, no, this amp, I mean, I believe me, like most of the, the IR thing was something I pushed for and they were initially right. like, that's gonna, and I was like, look, this, and I, I sort of, you know, walked them through a few things where I was like, let's really try and make this happen. The reactive load, they had to minute, I mean, where I give Kevin the credit is he actually pulled it off. Like he was right. able to miniaturize the react, the Sur reactive load, which was in a much bigger box, the standard one. They've got it down to probably one third the size when wow. it's in the That's amplifier great. now. So he it was in it was a lot of engineering that, but to pull off the vision of what, I wanted something simple uh, that was versatile. So that's yeah. a tough thing to, to you know to pull off something that's simple and yet will give you most of the colors and like you say then just add a few pedals and away you go you know this is something the great thing about it is you could have a little pedal board in the backpack this in one hand and your guitar in the other hand mm -hmm. and walk into the gig and you got a pretty like powerful yeah. situation going on and yet it's not a modeler with 128 presets it's all too it's an amp so yeah. you, mainly i just wanted to give people that are appreciate tube amps and enjoy tube amps but are maybe in situations these days where the the traditional tube amps aren't that practical you know you just can't turn them up and they're heavy and people won't you know can't you just go di like you know or and and then oh, maybe i should get you know a modeler or whatever but they're really like die hard like amp folks you know yeah. and maybe even some some people you know I, I think there's probably like with recording consoles how there's some people that engineer now are probably pretty great at recording that have probably never worked on a traditional console sure. you know i wanted to give Folks that have maybe never even played a, a tube amp, a reason to check one out. You know, if it's like, it's but fantastic. I like the versatility of my model or what. Well, it's like, check, this gives you a lot of that, you know, and, it's, it. and it's tube. So that's the idea. Well, this is great. <laughs> I, 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 we're going to sign off. Thank you ever so much. But while we're signing off, I want you to play. What, do you, what shall I do? Just, just play some rock. Have some fun. <laughs> Ah, 
I forget the end. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, man. I, I can't thank you enough for sitting through my spiel about this. Oh, thing. this is really amazing. I want you to play some more. We'll fade out on your playing. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Thanks so, Thanks so much. So much fun. Have a marvelous time recording, mixing, playing guitar. Leave a bunch of comments and questions below.